Hey and welcome back to another video and in this video we're going to be refactoring the app from our last video Easy Swift UI MVVM API call using URL session and in this video we're going to be using Swift Concurrency's async await and this time we'll see how we can use the new concurrency framework to simplify our programming. Now we're going to be building on top of the previous video to do this so if you need to start a project you can actually get this from my github which will be in the description box. So quickly just before we dive in let's actually just look at the project architecture. So we have our view here which just has a view model for getting the users that you see on the screen here and then in our view it's bound to our array of users and we have a function that we call to fetch these users. So in our view model we have our source of truth for where we store our users so our view can listen to this as well as if there's been an error and as well as communicating whether we are refreshing or not. And then we simply have a function here, fetch users, which is what we use to execute our request to get users from the service. And then within our fetch users, we have our model that we actually decode our API response from to match. So we can use that within our app. So this is represented on our view. Cool. So now let's go into our view model and we'll create a new function called fetch users new. And this is just a function so we can actually compare this against the old way of doing it in this project, which was using URL session. Let's we'll go scroll down here and I'm just going to collapse this function and I'll type this out. So when working with Swift concurrency, our function needs to actually be async. And this is because we need to tell the system to perform an asynchronous task somewhere on some kind of different thread. Now, when this task finishes, it will actually get back to us and notify us so that we can perform some operations on the response. Now, if you want to learn more about Swift concurrency, then you can check out my free course called Getting Started with Swift Concurrency on my channel. Now, in order to make our function asynchronous with in line with the new Swift concurrency framework, we need to actually mark our function with the async keyword. So let's do that now. So after here, if you just type out async like so, so now the system will know that this is actually an asynchronous function, meaning that it's going to perform some kind of asynchronous action and it will need to await the result. So we'll now use the URL session, but this time we'll use the asynchronous version. So let's actually type this out now. So we've got our URL that we're creating and we're making sure that it's safe. So we use optional chaining and then within our if let, we're actually using a do catch statement here. And the reason why we use a do catch statement is because it's possible that this line that we're going to get onto in a second could fail. So we're basically saying to the system, attempt to do this. And if it fails, then let's catch any errors within here. So what we're doing here is we're calling the new URL session dot data function, which is asynchronous. So we pass in the URL and you'll notice two keywords here. So the first keyword that we have is try. And like I mentioned before, this will try to fetch the data. And if it fails, then we can catch any errors. And the next one we have is await. So this await keyword here is us telling the system that we want to await the result. So this function here is asynchronous, meaning that we don't know when it's going to finish. So we need to wait for it to finish before we continue execution on the next lines. And then what this function does is it actually returns a tuple, which allows you to access the data and the response separately. So now we have our code for executing our request. We need to actually access our data from our tuple and now decode the response to our custom object, similar to the example above. So let's actually add this in now. So as you can see, we just create our own JSON decoder so we can actually decode the response and then using the data that we get back from our URL session data function, we actually try to decode it to an array of users. So notice here how we also use the try keyword because again, if this was to fail, it would actually throw an error and we can catch and handle it within this catch clause here. And then if everything is okay, it will set this to our users here so that you can see them on the UI. Cool, so now that we actually have the base stuff in our function working, so we're actually gonna look at error handling in a bit. So what you wanna do is you actually want to execute this function when your view appears. Now, if you actually go into your content view, you'll notice that we're actually using the on appear modifier to do this. When you're working with asynchronous functions, you actually don't want to use the on appear modifier. Instead, you want to use a modifier called task. And it's important to use this for when you want to execute an asynchronous function when your view appears, since this will handle canceling any tasks for you automatically and executing them as well. So rather than us having our on appear, let's just remove this. And I'm instead going to use the task modifier like so. 
And then within the task modifier, we want to tell the system that we want to await that fetch new users function. But if you actually notice as well, we actually have an alert here. And within our alert, we actually have a button where we actually call our fetch users. But we want to use the fetch new users. Now, this action here isn't actually a task. So we're not able to just directly just type in this. As you can see here, we actually get an error telling us that we're not able to use this asynchronous function because this action doesn't support concurrency. So how can we handle this within something like a button? Well, what we need to do is we actually need to create our own task within the button. So let's do that now. So what we have here now is we actually have our task within our button. So what's going to happen is that when we tap our button, we're going to create a task which will actually execute and await the result for our fetch users new. So the difference between these two is that this task is actually handled on the view. So when the view appears or it disappears, it will automatically handle the task execution and also the cancellation for us. All we're doing here in the button is we're just basically telling the system to execute a task, which is to go and fetch our users asynchronously. So that's the difference between doing it these two. So now let's actually just test this out. So let's go stop this from running. And then we're just going to execute this. And you should see that we're able to see our list of users within our application. Now, in our previous video, we actually had a loading spinner on the screen. So if I stop this from running, whilst our application was fetching the data, we actually had a progress view that was visible on the screen to communicate that something was going wrong, so to communicate that something was going on. So let's actually look at handling our spinner first, and then we'll also look at how we can handle errors in Swift Concurrency. So let's go back into our model. That our URL has been safely unwrapped. We want to set its refresh to true. And then it's only once we finish all of this code that we then want to actually set our is refreshing back to false. So let's add this in now. Cool. So like I said before, we're setting is refreshing to true after we've safely unwrapped our URL. And then we're using this keyword here, defer. And what this essentially means is that after everything has finished, it will actually execute whatever within this block here. So once all of this is finished, this will be the last line I'll execute, which is is refreshing is equal to false. So this will basically reset our is refreshing back to false. So we don't show our progress view anymore. Just so we can actually see our spinner in action, what I'm going to do is add in a delay. So let's do that now. And what I've just done here is I've just added in a task to tell the system to sleep for two seconds, just so we can actually see our progress spinner on the screen. So we just resume and just run this. You should notice that you see your progress spinner and then after two seconds you now see your users so this is all working really well now obviously we don't really want to have this in place it was just to show you that you know the progress spinner was working so i'm just going to take this out or you can comment it out it's whichever one you prefer so we've been running this on the swift ui preview but what i want to do is i just want to actually run this on the simulator to show you something interesting so let's do that now cool so we've been running this on the swift ui preview and everything looks great and everything looks fine but if you actually just look at this, if I just dismiss the canvas and you actually look at our code, when we run this on the simulator, we actually have a warning. So this is something that isn't going to show up when you're running your application in the Swift UI preview. So this is why I like to run it on the simulator to catch any of these type of warnings. So what this warning is telling us is that we're actually updating UI on a background thread, which we really shouldn't be doing. So when you actually execute asynchronous functions, like I said before, they're not actually published on the main thread. They're actually done on a background thread, meaning that it's kind of like put aside so the user can still use the app. And then once it's finished, you'll then get a response telling you that, hey, I'm ready. Now, when we get a response back, we're still on a background thread, but we're modifying UI. You always want to make sure that you modify UI on the main thread. So how can we fix these warnings that we're getting about our application? Well, what we can do is we can actually just simply mark our function main actor annotation. So let's do that now. So what it's going to do is that any UI that is affected by the properties that we're modifying within this function is going to make sure that they're published onto the main thread. So let's actually run this again and see what happens. And now we don't get those warnings anymore because we're making sure that we're publishing our UI updates back onto the main thread. So the next thing that we need to do is handle our errors. So let's actually do this now. So we'll look at handling our catch first and then we'll look at how we can work with our JSON decoder error. For our catch statement, what we actually want to do is that where we say is refreshing, we actually want to make sure that we set has error to false to make sure that it always resets. So let's do that now. 
okay cool and then what we want to do is that within our catch statement we want to also make sure that we set has error to true because an error has occurred and then we want to make sure that we set our user error to what has gone wrong so let's do that cool so now let's actually just test this out so what i'm just going to do is i'm just going to stop this from running and then we're just going to bring back our canvas cool and then in order to actually see this in action i'm just going to force an error here by just type in an invalid URL like so and then let's just hit resume and then let's just run this and see what happens and as you can see we now get our error message from our URL session data because this is telling us that it couldn't read the data from the response and decode it because this is the invalid URL cool so that works because it's actually from an error when it tries to decode the data but what about if we want to handle our own custom errors, like what we have here with our user errors, and we want to throw them? Well, we could do something like this. But I actually don't like this for a number of reasons. So what we've actually got here now is a problem because every time that we want to throw an error, we have to manually make sure that we set has errors equal to true, and we have to make sure that we set the self dot error to fail the decode as well. So it's actually very easy for us to forget to do these two things. And also it's a bit tedious that we have to do this every single time. So instead, what we should be doing in this case is just throwing all of the possible errors and handling them in our view directly. So let's actually update this to do this now. So the first thing we need to do is actually change our signature function to throws. And this tells the compiler that the function can throw an error if it wants to. So let's update this now. So after async, we just wanna type out throws to let the system know that you this function can throw some kind of error and now we actually just want to handle all the case paths where things could go wrong now our one case path that we didn't actually handle within this that we're going to do now is if the API response doesn't fall within a valid status code so when you're actually executing API requests you want to make sure that your status code is within the ranges of 200 and 299 to let you know that it was successful anything that's not within that range then it means that something's gone wrong so what we're going to do is we're going to actually check for this within our do statement here using our response so let's actually just type this up and then we'll break it down so what we're doing now is we're actually getting our response from our data and we're just casting it as a http url response and then we're just checking to see if the status code is within 200 and 299 and if it is then we'll continue or else we'll use this new keyword here that you may have not saw before called throw and what this essentially means is that we're going to throw an error called invalid status code so this is why we marked our function with the throws keyword because this is us throwing an error so this is essentially us stopping execution because something has gone wrong now the next thing we want to do is we actually want to refactor this json decoder logic here to this time rather than set the error we want to actually instead just throw that it failed to decode so let's do that now and then finally within our catch statement we just want to throw the error of what has gone wrong within our catch statement if you actually look at this compared to before this is a lot more readable and we can't actually miss any of the case paths where things could go wrong as well and if you compare this to our fetch users you can see here that in terms of readability, this is a lot more easier to read in terms of what's going on. So the next thing we need to do is actually use our has error and our error within our view, like I mentioned before. So within our view model, we're just going to cut these two properties and then we're going to paste it within our content view. Now, when you're working with your views, you can't actually use the publish property wrapper within a view. So instead, we need to use the state property wrapper. And then we want to make sure that we actually mark these as private because we don't want them to be exposed. Okay. And then because our user error was actually an extension on the user's view model, we need to just do user view model dot user error. 
and then we should be all good. Now you've got quite a few warnings down here and that's fine. We'll look at tackling that in a second. But what I want to do is just go back into our view model and you'll see now that our fetch users function is complaining because we've actually took those properties out now and moved them into the view. So realistically, we actually don't need this function anymore because we're not going to be using it. We're going to use the Swift concurrency. So I'm just going to comment out. But what you can do if you want to is you can actually just delete this. And then if you just scroll down here, you should notice that you still got a reference to it has error inside the fetch users new. So let's just remove that because we don't need that anymore. Okay, cool. So now we've got our function working. So you may be wondering why they move also the users and the is refreshing out into the view as well. Well, the reason being why I didn't do that is because with this function fetch new users or fetch users new, I should say, its whole responsibility is to execute a task and to tell us if something has gone wrong. So it throws an error. I personally, in my opinion, I like to keep my data that the business logic interacts with it within my view model. So as you can see here, we've got our users and our is refreshing properties, which our view listens to for changes, but our function here will just throw if something has gone wrong. So the only responsibility of this function is to tell us if something's gone wrong. So within our content view, now what we wanna do is we need to just refactor some of this code here to now use the properties that we've added to the view. So now within our task and within our button, we now have to actually mark our function as tries. But the problem that we got here is that we actually need to capture the error that this function has thrown. So we can set that to our has error and our error state properties within this view. So what I'm going to do is actually create a function within this content view for handling just that called execute. So let's actually just scroll down here and I'll do a bit of typing. Okay, cool. So what we have here now is we have a function called execute, which we've marked as asynchronous to let the system know that this, this can perform asynchronous actions. And then we try to fetch the users and we await the value. So it's going to execute this asynchronously. Now, if something goes wrong with this function, we're going to catch the error and then we're going to have to safely convert it. So say, safely cast it as our user view models user error. And then we're going to set has error equal to true again. And then we're also going to say that we want to set the error to the user error that we found. So now rather than using the fetch users new functions directly on both of these lines, instead, we're going to use our execute function. So let's do that now. So now let's actually just test this out and see what happens. And when we actually run this, you'll notice that we get an error saying that the request has fallen within an invalid range. And this is correct because this URL that we've given the system to execute isn't a valid URL. So in order to actually just see what a successful response looks like, let's remove these X's that we added at the end and then we'll rerun it. And as you can see, we get our users presented within our application. Cool. So we can actually see our errors now. We handle all the case paths and the function throws when something goes wrong. So that's everything in this video. If you enjoyed this video, I'd really appreciate it if you left some feedback in the comment section below. Also as well, if you haven't already, I'd really appreciate it if you like the video as well as subscribing to the channel and hit the notification bell to get updates for whenever I release a new video. That's everything from me. I'll catch you on a bit. Deuces.